That first decision turned out to be a mistake. Just weeks after the switch, complaints began pouring in. We've got children that have been harmed. I'm sorry and I will fix it. We have been doing our own testing and it does not match up with what the state's saying. 100,000 people who get poisoned, poisoned. A similar crisis exists in 32 other American cities, threatening the health of millions of Americans. Now, imagine a world in which every city, every town, and every home is under siege from this invisible threat residing in the walls, in the food, in the air. There would be one man who would encounter such a world and who would vow to dedicate his career to fighting this threat for the sake of humanity. Finding alarming increases of lead levels on the Earth's surface, he would battle against the industrial use of lead with his reputation, the integrity of science, and the health of the world at stake. His alarming papers would result in others joining the cause, eventually succeeding in reforming the gasoline, food, and health industries in the 1970s, yielding one of the greatest public health victories of the 20th century, Claire Cameron Patterson. Claire Patterson did not initially set out with the goal of saving the world in mind. As a graduate student working for his PhD at the University of Chicago in 1952, Patterson was given the daunting task of calculating the age of the Earth by a geologist named Harrison Brown. It was known that uranium decays into lead at a steady rate. All that Patterson had to do was find the amount of lead in an asteroid fragment and out would come the age of the Earth. After five years of tireless work, Patterson was still unsuccessful. Every time the measured amount of lead in the asteroid fragment did not equal the calculated or predicted amount of lead. He spent most of his time preparing to measure the age of the Earth, just finding and removing sources of lead contamination in his laboratory. And what he figured out is that he was the biggest problem, that when he came and went, he was constantly tracking in huge amounts of lead. Finally, after a total of six years, Patterson calculated the age of the Earth to be 4.55 billion years old, a number that still stands to this day. Patterson, however, would never again be content for the rest of his career, as he identified a new mystery, lead. Lead was historically known to be a harmful substance. Lead was a major factor in the downfall of the Romans, who used lead cooking utensils, lead-based makeup, and lead as sweetener in wine. When tetraethyl lead was initially discovered in 1854 by Carl Jacob Leywig, it was unused for another 70 years due to the known dangers of using the compound. As the 20th century ushered in the era of automobiles, the few industry took off. GM engineer Thomas Midgley came up with the idea of using lead as an additive in gasoline in order to reduce the knocking of a car engine. Requirement. What about this? Listen. Fuel knock that needs to be prevented. In 1922, DuPont of Standard Oil of New Jersey and Alfred Sloan and Charles Kettering of General Motors formed the Ethyl Gasoline Company for the production of leaded gas. Soon after, in April 1924, two factory workers at a plant in Dayton, Ohio, would die from lead poisoning. So the, the people who produced lead, they knew that it was harmful. They tried to say that that didn't matter. They tried to blame the workers who got sick um, in their factories, and they had their own science that they said proved that it wasn't harmful. When reporters interviewed chief chemist Dr. Matthew D. Mann at the Bayway plant, he said, these men probably went insane because they worked too hard. Dr. Robert Kehoe, who would eventually become a scientist on behalf of the corporation, working with contaminated instruments that produced incorrect data. The show would go on as production continued unhindered, filling the air and blood of America with lead for the next 50 years. In 1962, Claire Patterson would publish a paper on his study of the rate of lead deposits into ocean sediment. The paper concluded that the amount of lead presently dispersed into the environment each year was about 80 times the rate of deposit into ocean sediment. This disturbing discovery would lead Patterson to further investigate the presence of lead in other mediums. In 1965, Patterson would officially begin his battle against lead contamination, publishing the article titled, 
The Contaminated and Natural Light Environments of Man in 1965. In this paper, Patterson attempted to draw public attention to the problem of increased lead levels in the environment and the food chain. He would argue that the current quality of lead analysis was insufficient and compiled the amount of industrial lead entering the environment from gasoline, solder, paint, and pesticides. He also estimated that the lead concentration in blood for many Americans to be over a hundred times that of the natural level. Patterson would come head to head with the lead industry when he published a paper which analyzed the levels of lead in the 1,600 year old bones of pre-Columbian humans, successfully demonstrating the seriously elevated human lead burden in the 20th century. Shortly after the publication of this paper, Patterson faced immediate backlash. Many members of the science community labeled Patterson's claims as unfounded and ludicrous. Claire Patterson's funding as a researcher originally came from the American Petroleum Institute, and they tried to come and get him just to change his work, but he refused to do that. Then they cut off the funds, and then they tried to get the president of Caltech to fire him. Instead, he got money from the government, he got money in other ways to continue his research, and Caltech did stand by him. They never fired him, uh, and so he was able to persevere. He was self-assured in science and not one to follow the beaten path. He pursued his beliefs vigorously with what some would call a fanatical drive. Claire Patterson was an extremely unusual person, both in the fact that he was a great scientist, but he was also just incredibly strong-willed. It was a much simpler period in terms of how people communicated, and so it really kind of boiled down just to Claire Patterson arguing with people in person. I just think he was not intimidated by anybody. Patterson would not be deterred. Lecturing against the activities of the Ethel Corporation, Patterson would clash head-on with the lead industry. In 1970, he would publish another study, comparing the amount of lead in modern snow with pre-industrial snow, which he unearthed in Greenland. The results of the study showed that modern snow had 100 times the amount of lead as the pre-industrial snow. In 1971, Patterson was excluded from the National Research Council on atmospheric lead contamination despite being the most prominent expert on the subject. The panel was widely accused of not being forceful enough in interpreting its data and being too heavily weighted toward industrial scientists. Patterson applied his understanding of lead contamination to food, writing to the Commissioner of Food and Drugs at the United States Environmental Protection Agency that the laboratory was inadequate with other sources of lead in the room affecting the experiment results. The EPA would change its methods, according to Patterson's suggestions, resulting in the complete re-evaluation of lead in the food industry. At this point, others had joined Patterson's campaign, most prominently a doctor by the name of Herbert Needleman, who would also play a significant role in securing reforms against lead through his own work. It would be in the 1970s that Patterson would see all of his hard work begin to pay off, in 1973, the EPA would issue regulations to reduce the lead content of gasoline over a series of annual phases, which therefore came to be known as the lead phase-down. The Ethel Corporation would challenge these regulations by the EPA in the Supreme Court, but would lose the case in the end. In 1975, the United States mandated the use of unleaded gasoline in all new cars. Patterson had finally won his 30-year battle, moving on to other studies of interest for the remainder of his intellectual career. Thanks to Patterson's work in the 1990s, lead levels were reported to have dropped by 80% in the average American. Today, as we sit in the throes of great conflict and political turmoil over our environment, many questions occupy our minds. How can we prevent crises like this from occurring once again in the future? How can we continue to trust in the integrity of science? How do we fight against greed? For our time, Claire Cameron Patterson did more than take lead out of our gasoline, food, and air. He did more than reduce the lead levels in the blood of millions of Americans. Patterson demonstrated that while the world is in danger of greed and dishonesty, it is also in the care of a watchful few. It is in the care of people who would be willing to risk their careers and devote their lives to the fight for integrity and the well-being of humanity, readily willing to dedicate a lifetime of service, remaining unnamed, unthanked, and unsung. And that one of these people can be anyone, maybe even you.